Hey, guys. 81 and a half minutes I have. Let's just go to Genesis. For <laughs> <They're> wrong. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. I've had fun with you guys. You guys, man, I'm telling you. No, I really have. Yeah, like... What a great group of folks, man. Like, when you're up here teaching, you're not in my shoes, you might not understand what I mean, but you can perceive a lot of things when you're in the position I'm in. And what a bunch of open heart, just listening, hearing, taking. It's just fun being up here when you guys are sitting there. It's just fun. So we're going to have a blast. This is our last time together, but this is the beginning of something amazing, right? Yeah, super encouraged. The testimonies bless us beyond measure. Uh, the whole reason we do what we do is this very reason. We want to see Christ formed in people. And Paul said he labored continually that Christ be formed in folks. Amen? So uh, that's really what a pastor's place is, that people be formed in Christ. You, the biggest challenge of a local pastor is turning inward and just trying to have better services that people want to attend instead of forming them in Christ so they live their life effective when they're not at church. Yeah? And that's the biggest deal. So, where were we this morning? Colossians 1, we made it a lot of ways through. There's something I want to teach you, because I taught really, I taught, I taught really foundational stuff, right? So if you weren't here, who wasn't here for any of the sessions you just rolled in tonight? Oh, there's going to probably be a lot of hands. No, there's not a ton. Okay, there's a handful. I can't nutshell all the services or I'll use 79 minutes. But here's where we're at. Our lives are to be a living expression of Christ. We're the body of Christ. That term literally means the embodiment of him. The embodiment of who he is is who we are. Now, we didn't come up with that name. That's in Scripture. This is his idea. It's actually his idea to make man and live inside a man and shine through man. The whole reason we're on the planet, the whole reason we're on the planet is to shine. He said, you are the light of the world. Well, I thought you were, Jesus. Yeah, I am, and now I live in you through my blood, so you're the light of the world. That's what he told his disciples. You're the light of the world. And he told them to let their light so shine before men that the men would see their life lived and that light shining, and they would glorify the Father in heaven. Yeah? So the whole purpose of the cross is you to be restored back to the purpose in which God made man. That's why life's a challenge every time you live outside of purpose. That's why people think life is a grind, because they're living life outside of why they're here. So they're not finding grace in their life because they're traveling in places they're not created to travel, and God's not empowering that road. Are you with me? Come on, if I wake up, if you, if, I said this morning, if you get this one thing that I was saying this morning, I'm going to say this this evening. If you get one thing out of tonight, get this out of tonight, that every day you wake up, you can teach your heart through prayer and communion, which is why I want to get to Colossians 3. I really do. It's not a joke. And when we open our Bible, it's still going to be there. I'm so pumped about that. <laughs> but if you can learn this one thing, that when you wake up in the morning, nobody owes you a thing. That's a stretch for people because that's not, we've lived the total opposite way. But honestly, love, love, you just owe no man anything but to love, right? So, you know, owe no man anything but to love, and no man owes you anything. Why? Because you're created to love. Love's this way. The only reason we needed love is because we were separated from God. So now we get grafted back in, we get joined back into the source of love, and to know the love of Christ, Ephesians which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. You look up the word fullness, it means a house with no empty rooms. It means a town with no empty houses. This is to know the love of Christ. Not to know the love of your spouse, not to know the love of a friend, not to know the love of your parents or of your children. It's the love of Christ that fulfills you completely to where you're a house with no empty rooms. What's that mean? That means in your life there's absolutely no vacuums or no vacancy. You're completely and fully occupied. <laughs> All this exciting stuff. You see, it gets me going. <sighs> I got 76 minutes to be okay. <laughs> I'm going to be all right. I'm going to get through this. 
But we're talking about stuff that I absolutely love and live for. Like this is why Jesus came. Like Jesus came so he could live in me. And when I wake up with him in the morning, not wake up trying to find him, locate him, realize him. I wake up with him because he's in me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. He's as close as the mention of his name. And the just live by faith, not feelings. He's always here. He's always with me. He's always in me, and he ain't going anywhere forever. And you know what? I believe that. Oops. So I just wake up okay. People could treat me wrong. It has nothing to do. I shared with a young lady this morning, wasn't trying to be offensive when I say this to anybody because some of us have struggled with emotional abuse. But the truth is you can really only emotionally abuse somebody that doesn't truly know who they are. When you have need of things, you can get abused in those areas. When you don't know who you are, you can believe things that people are implying that are less than who you are. And the lie is what abuses you. And believing the lie is what torments you. You try to emotionally abuse me. It'll never, ever happen. You will get emotionally abused trying. (laughs) It's not going to happen. I'm a house with no empty rooms because I see the love of Christ for me. Why? Because I don't see the love of Christ through my circumstances always because I'm not looking there. You don't try to find the love of God through the way life's going. You're looking in the wrong place. If life's defining the love of God, how could you ever get rooted and grounded? If his love's always challenged by life and circumstances, how could you ever know? So how do you know Christ crucified, period? The measuring stick of God loving you is his son hanging on the cross for your life to be restored. It is important for you every day to wake up and know God loves you because Christ was crucified. You could say, well, if he loved me, how come I got laid off? And why did my spouse die early? And how come my child took off? And how come I was in that bad accident? I thought God loved me. See, none of those things should be in your language and challenge God's love. This thing isn't even about you, right? It's about you living him out in the midst of those things. When you're in a car accident, what's he look like in your shoes? When your child takes off, what's he look like in your shoes? Come on, it's the whole purpose of the cross. It's not for him to make sure everything goes cookie cutter perfect for your life and make your circumstances go well. It's to empower you to live like him and manifest him in the midst of the moment. It's why you're a Christian. It's why he lives inside of you, not so you feel fuzzy and bubbly, so that you shine in the midst of darkness. So that when you actually get betrayed in life, you don't know what it means to live betrayed because you've been done so right that you just live that way. And people look and marvel and they say, how come he's not hurt and bothered and frustrated? You have a higher vision. You have a different view on life. I'm not going to let what one person did and one person said or didn't say define my life and decide how I'm doing and, and who I am if their name's not Jesus. Are you with me? This is what I mean by nobody owing you anything. I'm just putting clarity to it. I'm just explaining what I mean because it sounds unreachable to people because we've lived so needy for so long. We've allowed so many other things to decide who we are and how we are that we haven't allowed the truth to make us free. But he that the Son makes free is free indeed because there's points of no return. When you see this thing, you see this thing. Are you hearing me? Yeah? It's really, really good. It's really, really good. So nobody owes you a thing. You wake up every morning. The whole reason mercy woke you up is gave you another day to look more like him. That's the number one reason you're alive. Please keep that big in your heart. The number one reason you're alive is to shine. Anything that infringes on the light has to be deception. Has to be a strategy of darkness to infringe on the light because darkness is freaked out by light. The last thing darkness wants is this room to shine. So it'll keep you a little mesmerized, keep you in indecision, keep you caught up in tit for tat. And he said, she said, well, I feel, well, how come they, well, that hurt, well, I shouldn't. See, when you're in that place, you're not shining. The whole purpose of the cross is for you to bear witness of his image and God is light. And there's no darkness in him, 1 John 5, 1, or 5, 5, and there's no darkness in him at all. Yeah? 
1 John 1, chapter 1, it's around verse 5. God is light, and in him there, I mean, God in him there is light, and there's no darkness in him at all. None. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and where does he live? So you can do all this, well, brother, yeah, but you got to realize. You can do that all day to me, and I won't hear a word of it. I'm having way too much. If I'm in a dream, leave me alone. Don't wake me up. I'm having way too much fun. Yeah? Okay. So let's jump into Colossians. Let's do it. I know you don't believe me. That's why you didn't get excited. I ruined you in a couple sessions. Look at that. Who was here this morning? Okay, so if you were here this morning, you understood that we read through Colossians and, and it was, you understand why we had a hard time getting through it. There's a lot there, isn't it? There's a lot there. I color my Bible. I have a color code in my Bible. I, I, I color my Bible. So like purple is commandments, conditions for promises, things were called to walk out and live. So if you look at my Bible, everything has a meaning when you see my Bible's really pretty. Like... Like, look at all that purple. All that is conditions for promises and commandments. If you see purple, orange, purple, orange, that means a condition to walk in this, a condition to walk in this. So if I yield to this, I'll walk in this. That's how I do my whole Bible. It really, pff, things, Holy Ghost says, doo, 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 and you're like, <laughs> it's so amazing. <laughs> but, but you can just go through and you can just see there's a whole lot of purple. Oh, there's green. That's the love of God. There's orange. That's a big, fat promise right there. It's just, man. Like, that was a serious... Did you see that promise? Oh! So, oh, I just want to go get alone and read my Bible right now. Just... <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> okay, so this is Colossians 1. This is why we had a hard time getting through. Like, all this is rainbow. See, that's rainbow. That's just like, whoa. So I take all my colors and just do like this massive rainbow when it's stuff that you really can't put in a category because it's like almost too good to be true. So I just rainbow it. <laughs> that's like a massive rainbow. It starts in verse 13, the rainbow, and it goes the whole way through verse 19. That's a six-verse rainbow. So I'm explaining why we didn't reach Colossians 3, because I was stuck in the clouds, baby. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and we learned that Paul's praying for Christians that are on point. He's praying for Christians that don't look like they need prayer. Why? Because he wants them to continue to walk in truth and purpose and walk in all the will of God and run the race worthy of a prize. Never grow weary in well-doing. See, we always pray with, for people that seem like they're struggling. Paul had a different idea. In Ephesians and Colossians, he prayed for people that were on point. Because he said, man, they're there. Let's pray they stay there and always live there. Yeah? yeah. That doesn't mean you don't pray for people that, that, that are going through a hard time. That's a given. But sometimes that's all we pray for. Paul said, man, since I heard the way you're living, I haven't ceased praying for you. That these things be built and established in so you can keep on doing what you're doing with power and effectiveness. Yeah? So then, then we learned that, that, that we were partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light and that he has delivered us. Past tense. I said this morning, if every Christian would just walk in their bedroom alone and just believe this, you know what, and get, let go of feelings, let go of past testimonies, let go of yesterday. Paul said, the one thing I do to get to where I'm heading, to lay a hold of what he laid a hold of me for, the one thing, not the one of two, the one thing, the one thing, not one of two, the one thing I do is forget what lies behind. He told us to never look back, remember Lot's wife, put your hand to the plow, don't look back. There's all kinds of scripture that tells you there's nothing there. Yeah? yeah? So we're not Lot's wife. Why would we look back? We're his bride. Let's look up from whence come our help. Let's not look back. When you look back, you get stuck from where you were delivered and where you're heading. You're stuck in the middle looking back. You never get to destiny. That's what happened. She looked back from where she was delivered 
There's a place you're heading. You never get there because you're looking here as you're trying to get there. You're stuck looking here. <sighs> so what would happen if you wake up in the morning and you actually believe this and you sit up in your bed tall and raise your hands and there ain't nobody looking and you say, Father, I thank you. You have delivered me from the power of darkness. You love me. You live inside of me. You are my king and I worship you. Yeah? And your body feels like sleeping another hour. But you know you have to get up because you have responsibilities and instead of dreading it and complaining it and complaining about it to the Lord calling that prayer. I got you, didn't I? I got y'all. I felt it. Bam. Ooh. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> I go to bed tonight. I'm going to have blood on my sword, buddy. <laughs> Ooh, I felt that. You know what we do? Oh, six o'clock? No way. Oh, why would I have to pee in the middle of the night, break up my sleep, Lord? I just asked for one night, just one night, all the way through, please. You think I could just get one night? Now I got to go in there, and if that boss is, oh, Lord, please, you got to give me grace. And that's our prayer life. I know I'm not that far off because all the laughing is uncomfortable and it's there. <laughs> all that laughing is, oops. <laughs> then you torture your flesh and keep it alive and you keep hitting the snooze button when you know you got to get up. And then right when you're just about, meh, meh, <laughs> and then you buy nine more minutes of torture. <laughs> Why don't you just crucify the thing and just sit up? Just sit up. And just say, man, thank you for living in me. What another day. Man, you know what? I used to dread the mood of the boss on the way to work, and now I understand he just doesn't see and know. Man, you put life in me, truth in me. Let the light shine through me today. Holy Spirit, have your way in me. Man, I used to dread thinking I had to work beside Tommy or Johnny and just their attitude and the F-bomb all the time. God, put me right beside them. Them men need love. And I just thank you, God, for their lives, their families, and let me have some sort of voice or influence in them today. I used to loathe my job. Lord, now I understand I have a different purpose on my job. Man, my days of complaining are over. Life is a gift. Thank you for giving it to me. That's the only stuff I know how to pray. That's the only way Holy Spirit ever taught me. He never taught me to do that. Oh, man, six o'clock. Never got that from him. As I prayed and sought him and asked me to lead, asked him to lead me and teach me and guide me and all these things, he just never was in that place. I never saw him there. He never took me there. He always took me where I just modeled for you. Boy, if you would just let that thing change, right? Then the light can shine. Come on, nobody lights a lamp and then puts a basket over it. So we talked about this stuff in Colossians, and, and we got to a real fun part. You might want to look there if you have a Bible. In, in Colossians 1.21 he said, and you, 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 he's talking to you and me. You were alienated, you were enemies. What estranged us from God is the way we thought in our minds, the motive in our life, the way our minds worked. We all live from the realm of self-centeredness. Every one of us was born into Adam and we must be born again. So we were all born into the need of love. We were cut off from God and not one of us in this room had an identity when we were born. Life tried to decide that for us. By a very young age, you grew up believing your value and believing who you were and what you believed was nothing more than how you responded to how life unfolded. Yeah? You get laughed at in grade school and you're old enough to realize they're not laughing with you, they're laughing at you. And you're faced with responses. You can either get hurt, broken, angry, frustrated, introverted, or become a fighter. But no matter how you respond, it's not the real you because you're always responding to things. You're always in defense and survival. And you say, oh, well, I'm just, well, I'm this personality, I'm this. No, no, that's all Adam. You don't want to bring any of that along with you in Christ. 
Life tried to force us into who we are. So many of us at a very young age were already shattered, already hurt, already insecure, already hard, already jaded. We have people in our life that we're depending on, and they're just not dependable. There's people that just aren't dependable, but we need them to be, but they aren't, and they can't be. My dad, he didn't have the ability. He was a dry cup. My dad was a dry cup. He didn't have the ability in his young years, in his 20s. He had two boys by the time he was 20. He, 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 he was young. He got into alcohol. He's a dry cup. He needs help. He needs Jesus. He needs life. But I'm a little boy. I need a dad. We got a problem. If I'm trying to drink out of a dry cup, of course I'm thirsty. And he can't give me a drink. And if I start identifying myself through the thirst and through his dryness and the way he treats and acts and doesn't pull through and doesn't, and next thing you know, I weigh my value based on his dysfunction. And then I'm 40 years old and that's still my story and resume and testimony. And now it's my justification for being wherever it is I am. I'm not selling cheap like that. I'm not for sale. I've been bought with a price. I found the truth through him. See, I'm trying to drink through things that are dry. That's why I'm thirsty. Jesus said, if you'd ask of me, I'd give you a drink. And the drink I give you, it'll fill you. It'll be a wellspring up in the everlasting life. And if you drink just one drink from me, you'll never thirst again. What's he talking about? Fulfillment of identity, finding out who you are, stepping into the truth, coming out of the lie, into the truth, out of darkness, into the light. One drink, just one drink, boom. <gasps> yeah. All of a sudden, I'm not mad at my dad. I'm not hurt by my dad. I don't have regrets with my dad. All of a sudden, I have compassion for my dad, and I love my dad, and I care for my dad, and I want to see him filled now. Why? Because he fills the thirsty and floods the dry ground. This drink just isn't for me. This drink is for every dry thing around me. Yeah? Come on. You think with me, every one of us were trying to find identity from the time we were born. We needed value, love, support. We needed something from somebody, and most of us didn't get half of the list we needed. It's through Jesus. The strategy of hell and the devil is to get you so hard, so hurt, so broken, so angry, and so deceived. By the time good news comes, there's nothing good about it because it's too late. And where were you when I needed you, God? And all of a sudden, you can't even step into the answer because your heart has been so twisted by the course of events in the lives. That's the strategy of hell. And if you relate to that tonight and you say, yeah, I get that, and why wasn't God in this and that, I'm encouraging you to reconsider. He's the only one that's good. He gave us a way of escape while we were yet sinners. You say, if God's good, then why'd he let it happen? If God wasn't good, why'd he send his son? Maybe we're too busy in a fallen nature challenging the only one that's good. Maybe in a pride that puffs us up in a human nature. Maybe in the thing that we call wisdom that God calls foolish, we're accusing him and maybe we're wrong. Come on, I'm just talking plain. Worst you can do is shoot me if you want to. I'm not going to die anyway. Save the bullet. See, they tried to kill Stephen. They thought if they'd kill him, they'd shut him up. Truth does for never shuts up. Truth's still on the earth. They killed Stephen. Truth's still on the earth. They killed Jesus. It didn't work. They killed Stephen. It didn't work. They killed thousands of Christians over the generations, and here we are still talking about him, excited about him. We sang that song tonight, man, where breath started coming into him, and he rose from the grave, and that song rocks, man. And you felt the room, right? Don't you love them songs where you don't know what to do? You ran out of things to do? You're, you're so blowing up inside, you don't even know what to do anymore. You're like... <laughs> You tried everything, you, the song, and you're like. <laughs> you don't even know what to do. That thing is. And you're like. Yeah, yeah. I just look over the pastor and we're like. Yeah. Yeah. Because we ran out of options. We tried everything. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And then Jeremiah's just. And he's taking it higher. And I'm going, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Who was there with me? <laughs> I'm losing it, ain't I? <laughs> you don't care, do you? <sighs> ah, let's keep moving. Oh, dear Jesus. Lord, I don't know what we're going to do if I don't make it to Colossians 3. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. So, so we learned that, that, you, that you and I were alienated. Our minds were contrary to the kingdom. 
We were thinking self-centered, guys. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Come on, you can be a Christian. You're still not thinking for the kingdom. Are you thinking about your life bringing his name glory? Or are you thinking about him benefiting your life? See, if all you're thinking is him benefiting your life, you're disappointed and have questions when the benefit doesn't come. And now you're in a quandary, and now he's even in question. And if he's in question, you're not having intimacy with him. You're not going to get pregnant and bear anything that looks like the Father. But if you're alone with him and you're with him, oh, you'll bear fruit unto him, and everything that comes out of your life will look just like him. It's a spiritual truth. It's not weird and wacky. Yeah? Come on. If you don't see clear who he is, why would you draw near to him with an unveiled face and give yourself to him and be one with him and be intimate with him? If you don't think great of him, if you, come on. The strategy of, of, of darkness is to get you to have a twisted view of who God is and to find the view through your life. You don't find your view of God through your life. You find your view of God through Jesus in his life. He's the revelation of the Father. Your circumstances are not. Your circumstances mean you're in the world, but it's time to be in the world and not of the world. And we've got to stop letting the world speak louder than the truth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What's that mean? That means how can I bring him glory and manifest him and shine in him in every situation I'll ever encounter? I got to think for the kingdom. I don't think for my own sake. If I think for my own sake, I'm always going to be in trouble. Fear lives there. Worry fears lives there. Dread lives there. Discouragement lives there. Anger lives there. Frustration lives there. Everywhere there's self-centered intention, all those perverted things that never produce life in any of us live there. Yeah? That's why you deny yourself. You pick up your cross. You never again let sin against you give the right to produce sin in you. You overcome evil with good. Yeah? yeah? You guys good? Yeah. All I'm preaching is the gospel. It's all in the book. Nothing else is the gospel. We preach a lot of things that benefit us. And when I read this book, it's supposed to transform us, not bless us. The blessing is the transformation. Yeah. When I get free from me, I'm finally free. What a bondage to live for me. It's the loneliest party you're ever at. Unless the seed dies and falls to the ground, it's alone. Self-centeredness is the loneliest party. You ever feel sorry for yourself? You ever get tricked feeling sorry for yourself? It's the loneliest party you ever attended. And the only people that want to sit in that party is people that relate to your pain. None of them can help you. They're just supporting your pain and understand how you feel. The last thing you need is someone just to understand how you feel. You need someone to give you an answer to get out of how you feel because how you feel isn't producing the kingdom. It's crushing you. You don't want to get reduced to the highest grace you receive is that somebody seems to care about my story. You want to receive that somebody has an answer in the midst of my story and cares enough about me to tell me what it is and not leave me there and give me a reason to stay there. You good? Come on, you don't hear that insensitive. There's not a thing insensitive in my heart about that. Right? You good? Okay. He reconciled us while our minds were all whacked out and self-centered and we were living for me, myself, and I. In the midst of that, he came through the body of his death and reconciled us through death to present us. This is where you got to live, guys. Present us holy, blameless, and above reproach. Where? We learned it this morning. In his sight. You're holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Wow, if you wrap faith around that scripture, that'll take care of insecurity and identity crisis and low esteem. That'll blow works out of your life and cause you to stand in grace and say yay and see his first love and be overwhelmed with love for him. Yeah? Yeah? Come on, you're holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If indeed, if indeed, if indeed you continue believing that and don't let anything change your mind. So he goes on speaking. We're going to skip a stone to chapter 2 because i got to make some headway. Oh, I love the whole thing. It's so colored up. It's rainbow after rainbow. Yeah, don't tempt me, sister. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, but get thee behind me right now. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, no we're, I'm a yeah, too. I get it. It's yeah. 
I mean, that's, that, that dear sister came up here and said she got this revelation from this scripture and she talked about the manifold. Well, she said it wasn't in Colossians. <laughs> but it was where she was talking was Ephesians 3. And it says it's the intent of God. The intent of God. The intent of God in the gospel is that the manifold wisdom of God would be revealed by the church to the powers and principalities. And that he already accomplished and established this truth through his son. And then after Paul says that, he said, For this reason I bow my knees and pray to the Father whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that you all be formed and established in love. That's really what he prayed. Ain't that something? See, I read this book. So when somebody shares a testimony and just quotes a piece of that scripture, I got five sermons popping off of me. I'm like, right. I'm like, I just want to go curl up and read my Bible and cry and become more like him. Because all I've ever found in this truth that I cry to you is freedom. I never was free when I thought for me. I was always in the way. The biggest bondage of your life is you thinking for you. You being a Christian for you is a terrible mistake. You have to be a Christian for his glory and his name. You have to be a Christian for the sake of others. You have to die so you can truly live. And you'll find blessing that's beyond description in that place of faith. Blessing beyond description. Can you see how gone I am? I'm either a really good actor and she gets some kind of Christian preaching Emmy. <laughs> or I believe what I'm telling you. And I've tasted it. And I've seen it's good. Yes. You know what you do when you love somebody? You know what you do when you love somebody? I'm, I'm assuming you love somebody. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Good, good. No, no. You don't have to put an extra arm around her. Try, now he wants to be an octopus. Yeah, he just, no, <laughs> I'm just having fun. Watch this. So when you love somebody, you eat something amazing, what do you, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to say, oh, honey, you got to try this. Oh, my goodness, right? Something like that. You try something that's awesome, and you're like, oh, honey, try it. Well, I'm not really hungry. Oh, it's okay. Just try it. Just a little taste. you got to see. It's so amazing. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Yes. When you're really sincere, and you really care, and you really love people, you'll get on a plane because you know they're going to be here. See, I was right. I knew you'd be here. <laughs> you get on a plane, they give you a mic, and you just pour out your heart because you believe if somebody listens and applies some of these things to their life, it could be the biggest, most freest day of their life, and they could become more fruitful than they ever dreamed, and their life could matter and carry a legacy and bring glory to his name. So you, you get on a plane... You say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, no, this is not my way of living. I didn't come on this plane in a business deal. I told you that the other day. You might not know that. I will not take a penny home from this conference. I'm here because I believe the truth that I'm pouring out with passion. I am not here for one penny, and I won't take one. Tom already knows that. If he tries, I'll kill him. <laughs> and maybe God will raise him from the dead and get it right. <laughs> and if not, he'll be out of his misery. And he'll be with Jesus. Because I don't have a business deal with Tom. I don't have a business deal with this pastor. I came because I wanted to come. I bought my own plane ticket on Jesus' finances. Yeah? Yeah. That changes things a little, huh? Oh, yeah, speakers, speaker fees. There is no fees. It grieves me. People email me and say, how much does it cost to bring you in? Probably the time it took you to shoot send on the email. I'm not in this to earn a living. I am living. Are you hearing me? And I just feel like I got something to say. And people just hand me mics. They hook me up and say, go, and I manifest. <laughs> this is why you never put the devil on the stage. Do you see what happens when you put somebody up front? They manifest. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the devil would love to be on the stage of your mind in your life. He'd love to get your focus and attention. He'd love you to mic him up and flip on the on switch. 
argue with him, talk to him, try to talk him down, ignore him. He's a cut off withering branch coming to nothing. Totally ignore him. Submit to God. That way you'll resist him and he'll flee. He has no other option. Don't you spend time on the devil. You spend time getting to know Jesus and proclaiming truth. And as you do that, you will freak the devil out. And if he wants to hang out in your bedroom, don't even care. Let him suffer if he wants to. I could care less if he pulls up a chair beside me. Totally could care less. I'm born again. The Spirit of God's in me, and I don't have compromise, and there's nothing in him that's in me and in me that's in him. He's a cut-off withering branch. He can sit right beside me. It wouldn't even bother me. He can watch me worship and manifest if he wants. Oh, I could tell you some stories. I won't get into it. I'll never reach my destiny. But when you see a guy passionate and serious like me, Sometimes people think it's because everything's going great. Wonder if it's because of all the fire and the trials and you've come to know like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that he really is Lord. Wonder if this passion you see him is because of the trials. Wonder if it's because of witchcraft coming and trying to kill you when you get started and first get on fire. Wonder if it's from all the deceptions and lies around you that try to... Wonder if it's from your family taking wrong turns and being part of that strategy and Satan playing everything he can to try to get you to shut down and not be on fire. I wonder if here I am 26 years later and everything's restored. My family's doing amazing and we've lost nothing except gained a deeper revelation of what we've always believed. And Jesus is absolutely it. Do you get it? So that's why you see this in me, because of fire. Not because of blessing. Yeah? <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know that. Because there's so many people just looking for blessing, looking for blessing, and they're living disheartened, wondering when their breakthrough's coming. And the stone is already rolled away. <sighs> I don't say this stuff with a camera running, and you sure got them running. Oh, Lord Jesus, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but it's because it's right here. I have no knowledge of ever play, praying for a blessing in my whole Christian life. It would never even dawn on me. I've prayed for more of him. And I've prayed to rightly manifest him in the moment. And I've found nothing but immeasurable blessings that would make me cry if I try to go into it. I am blessed beyond measure. And I've never asked for it. I found Psalm 67. Our God, yes, our own God shall bless us. That settles it for me. <laughs> so then I probably ought to get to know our own God. My goal is becoming more like him, not him blessing my vats and barns. I want to walk in the light as he's in the light. What good does it do to have full vats and barns and not walk in the light? What good does it do to get the promotion and not manifest the Son of God on the job? Come on, ooh, that's a good quiet. That's not even a funny quiet. That's a good quiet. Oh, I felt that. That's another. <laughs> wow. I got 43 minutes and I'm scared. Verse 6 of chapter 2, we're getting so close, guys. We're getting so close. As you therefore, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How'd you receive him? By faith. Who here's going to heaven when they die? Who here believes they're going to heaven? Oh, well, that's a lot of hands. Are you sure? If you're sure, leave your hand up. How do you know? Oh, because the Bible tells you so? So you just know? How do you know you're going to hell? How do you know? You just believe it, don't you? So if that many people believe they're going to heaven, and it's because the Bible says so, then that's just all tonight. Just believe we're totally forgiven, washed clean, pure, and holy in his sight, accepted in the beloved, fulfilled through Jesus. Why don't we all just believe we're lacking no good thing? Why don't we just all believe we're in and can never be out? As you've received him, so 
Walk in him. How would you receive him? By faith. How you walk out him. You're always looking unto Jesus, the one who authored and started this journey, and the one who will what? You will never finish the race if you don't keep your eyes totally fixed on him. And looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Even in Hebrews, when he quotes the psalmist and says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? It's so funny. The psalmist is trying to figure out what is up with man that God visits him and considers him. Like, what is up with man that God would give him dominion over the work of his hands and make him his crowning creation and glory? What's up with man? That's what he's writing. He says, in saying that he's not withheld anything being under our feet, he's put all things in subjection under our feet. Yet, we don't see all things in subjection under our feet, but we see Jesus. What's he telling you? Don't ever go into that quandary place. Don't ever let your questions get so many that it robs you of the things you know. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, I feel that way too. No, that was a good clap. I like it. Oh, Jesus, are you sure? I see, I'm just going to believe I'm being led by the Lord, so it's, everything's his fault. I tell you, don't even waste time emailing me. Just send it to the Lord. I'm not going to read it. Don't even send it. It's the Lord's fault. I'm just going to blame it on the Lord. And if I was wrong one day, I'll, I'll handle it then. But don't send me an email. <laughs> he talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1. He talks about the abundant mercy of God that's birthed us again to into living hope and the resurrection of the dead to an incorruptible and undefiled uh, inheritance that doesn't fade away and it's reserved in heaven for us so there's something we're living toward there's some goal we're living toward and that's eternal life and carrying a legacy with us right there's an inheritance right who are kept we're kept we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time watch this in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be interesting phrase if need be you have been grieved by various trials. Who's ever been grieved by various trials? Okay, then we ought to all listen. We're probably on track. Why does God even allow this? Why doesn't he just shut it all off? Because he's given us every way to win. He's given us the word, the authority of his name. He's told us to not love our own lives. He said, don't fear. God's already giving us countless answers. We're waiting him for him to just go with a buzz gun and just stop the problem. Did he ever put Shadrach's fire out? He let them right in the middle of it and just made sure they were free. To where the king's best shot had no power over the real king's boys. If he put the fire out, he's given glory and power to the fire. That means he's threatened by the fire or we're threatened by the fire. So he lets it burn to teach us the fire is never the issue. It's what you believe in the middle of the fire that's the issue. The fire is never the issue. That's why he didn't put it out. If he puts the fire out, he's, he's given power to the fire, and now we need the problem to go away. Man, that is good. It is. If need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Why? That the genuineness... Not the quip, confession, not saying the right thing, quoting the scripture like it's a Bible principle. The genuineness of your faith. See, everybody prays when trouble hits that's a Christian. People that aren't a Christian pray when trouble hits. You get diagnosed with cancer, it's the normal thing to pray. Call your friends and all your friends pray. When your numbers go up, that might be when you find out if you really have faith. Anybody can pray when there's trouble on the horizon. But what about continuing to believe when the trouble doesn't change? I wonder if Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego would have shifted gears as they were falling in the fire. Or once they got down to the front door before the guards opened it and got burned up. Which is a funny story because if the guards got burned up, how'd they even get in? 
Jesus. Oh, yeah. The fire's raging. They can't even, they open the door and the, the two guards just bacon, done, toast. And there's three guys bound, hand and foot. They're, they're, they're bound. They look like mummies. How'd they get in there? There's, they got burned. There's nobody to put them in. Doesn't even say. I think Jesus said, oh, this is going to be so good. And then he, fourth man, shiny. Ever see Veggie Tales? There's a fourth one in there, boss, and he's really shiny. I watched it with my granddaughter when she was little, and all that light comes shooting out all them windows, and I just start crying at Veggie Tales. Why? Because of the revelation. My little granddaughter looks every time it would come on, she's looking at Grandpa, waiting to see how long it takes to cry. <laughs> and I'm watching Veggie Tales. He got a little cucumber and a little tiny squash, and he's going, uh, How many did we throw in there? Uh, uh, three, boss. But there's four in there, and the, the woman is really shiny. And he says, Shaq, Rack, Benny, come out of there. You ever see it? I'm like, (laughs) never put the fire out. You ought to get that. You ought to get that. That the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold. Faith is an amazing thing. It's impossible to please God without it. Why? Why is faith? I know people that got frustrated with faith over the years. Why is it always about faith? Why is it always about faith? It's a gift from God to keep you from living sensual because that's all we know in Adam. All you know is sensuality and feelings. Most Christians still live by their feelings. They get all their prayer based on feelings, all their ministry based on feelings. Very little faith applied to our lives. And somehow we got this weird idea that until I feel better, I'm not better. If you don't believe better, you'll never be better. If you don't see different, your eye doesn't change. Your light, your lamp, nothing will ever change. Are you with me? The genuineness of your faith. Being more precious than gold. Though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love him. And though now you don't see him, whoever said, boy, I don't see God in this. But you see him. You get it? Come on, it's all scripture. This is all here. Oh, did you ever read this? This is amazing. (laughs) Found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus, whom having not seen you love, though now you don't see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That is not a lot of Christians I've met. Not saying you. It's just not a lot of Christians I've met. That's why I'm intense and passionate on these topics. Try to turn that thing. This is scripture. Inexpressible. Joy inexpressible in the midst of the thing you don't even see God in. Why? Because of what you believe. It ain't, oh no, Nebuchadnezzar lit the fire. That looks really hot. Yeah, I hope God comes. I don't know, man, should we, we might have spit off more than we chew. I hope we didn't speak out a term when we talked to Nebuchadnezzar like that. Nope. What's your fire to us, O king? We don't even have a need to answer you in the matter. Well, I'll tell you what, God's able to deliver us from your fire. And even if he doesn't, you need to know something, pal. We ain't bowing to you. He's the Lord. But nevertheless, he'll deliver us from your fire. Let's get it on. It was never about the fire. It was about who they believe. (sighs) Full of glory, receiving the end, the end result. Receiving the end result, the consummation, the end of your faith, dash, the salvation of your soul. 
There's a restoration of your mind and emotions that God wants to do through faith because it separates you from sensuality. So he deals with the first problem when you come into this thing. He tells you to stop thinking for you. Deny yourself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Why do you worry about stuff? Isn't life more than that? Come on, it's all scripture. I found it all in the book. But the key is you got to believe it like a child. Just like an innocent child. Yeah? Come on. Little child, stand here. I say, come on. I could be way back there. Just jump. Why? In that child's mind, he doesn't even know. When he's real little, he doesn't even know to think I won't catch him. There's a point where that innocence gets lost. There's a point where self-consciousness enters in. There's a point where things begin to change. That's why Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. There's a place of innocence and trust and just believing him. And if he says he loves me, he loves me. Yeah? Listen, I'm just telling you, I believe this. In my days of anger, frustration, bitterness, discouragement, disheartness, it ended a long time ago. My days of getting ticked off at you, judging you, preconceiving things in my mind about you ended a long time ago. Who would I be to walk in a room and assess your value and decide who I think you are when you're made for God's image and you were predestined to be a son before the foundation of the world? How presumptuous and self-righteous have we become through the fall of man. And then we get born again, live in church, stay in church, live in Christian homes, and still don't address those things that are keeping the light from shining. Wow. Okay, let's go back to Colossians. You got to see this. Now, this is where I want to teach you. So we're finally there. We're at Colossians 3. Oh, no. No. Well, well, we're not quite there yet. Watch. (laughs) I just realized you're established in the faith, right? So the way you received him, Colossians 2, 6, you're going to walk in him, rooted, built up, and established in the faith as you have been taught. Well, I don't know where you're all from, but you can't say you haven't been taught because you've been here tonight. Okay. Abounding in this thing with thanksgiving. Now watch this, verse 8. Beware, take heed, right? Right? There's a lot of different translations here, uh, and they're all good. Beware lest anyone cheat you. Some say rob you, take you plunder, hold you captive. There's a lot of translations. They all mean the same. Watch. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men and the basic principles of the world. Watch. And not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and all power. And you better believe that's rainbow, baby. That's rainbow. One, two, three, four, five. I got the next five, six verses rainbowed. Seven. I can't read it. We'll never make it to three. Go to Colossians 3. Okay, watch this. I got 28 minutes. Now I'm smooth and feeling it right now. Yeah, 28 minutes after two sessions already expired. (laughs) But we built up here, didn't we? We got a lot accomplished along the way. Now, all that stuff I preached, here's the punchline, and it's saved till the end. You say, how in the world do I live this way? That's what people say. How in the world do I walk? How why I'm in the world? How in the world? How why why I'm in the world do I walk in love? How do I live the things you're preaching that are convicting my heart, that make sense to my heart, that my inner man says yes, yes, yes to? Because you can hear what I'm saying. I don't talk in riddles. I don't talk. I'm not talking so deep that you're like, What's he saying? (laughs) Even the people that don't want to hear, hear. I love that. (laughs) Because you can't not hear. It's too simple. A child can hear what I'm saying. Since you were all raised with Christ, I actually read the first couple words of Colossians 3. (laughs) 
Since you were all raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Okay? Seek those things which are... So that sounds like seek ye first the... Okay. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Uh Uh-oh, verse 2. He really loves us. He's really helping us because he knows what happens to the mind and where the mind wants to go and what the mind wants to do. He says, set... This is your part, my part. This is your part, my part. Set your mind. There's times you just got to set your mind in the right things. There's times you just got to grab your mind and say, no, no, no. That's irrelevant. That ain't going nowhere. That ain't producing life. This is the truth. Bam. Shut your mind. Yeah? You set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. So almost at the risk of redundance, he says the same exact thing in two verses. He repeats himself in two verses. Same thing. When God says the same thing in two verses, he really wants us to listen. For you died. See, you didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. You didn't just sign up in a book. You just didn't change destinations. You died. And if we miss that part, we're not going to walk in the freedom that the cross brings. You died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, with God in Christ. Are you with me? And uh, watch this. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, when Christ who is our life. Do you hear this language? When Christ, who is now our life, appears, then you're going to appear with him in glory. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, it means in light of what I just said. That's why you never preachers, you never jump in and just preach and tear it up from a therefore. You don't ever start a therefore. You always make sure they know what it's there for. You back up a little. And you make, no, it's the biggest mistake people make with the Bible. They jump in and read it out of context, and then they make it say what it sounds like instead of what it's saying in its place. These things we call cults out there, the only thing they do is pull five different scriptures out of five different places, piece them together to make a statement, but they're not saying that in their own place. And if they show you one of them pamphlets and you know the word, you can take a pen and chop that all up and expose that and make them wonder what they believe. I've done it. I've seen it. It's a lot of fun. No, I'm I'm serious. I'm saying, well, this isn't scripture. Well, it's all scripture. No, it isn't. This came from here, and this came from here, and this came from here. You pieced it together. That's like saying, and Judas hanged himself. Go and do there likewise. (laughs) They knocked on the wrong door one day. I answered, hello. <laughs> My wife was standing against the wall listening, going, Sunday." <laughs> and I watched two young men tremble down my street, not even sure what they believe. I stepped over my railing and said, no, no, guys, listen to me. And I went after them. <laughs> I said, we're leaving. No, 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 listen to me. Don't you dare knock on one of my neighbor's doors and tell them what you're not even sure of. You go get an understanding if you ever step back on this block. Make sure if you knock on their doors, you know what you're saying. Next day, two senior elders knocked on my door. Senior elders. I said, I'd love to rejoice that you're here, but the only reason you're here is to find out what I told them boys so you can better train them against a fellow like me. It's the only reason you're on my porch. And they put their heads down. I said, but it's okay. Come on in. Let's chat. (laughs) They came to my home group. They told me I had no authority to do the things I'm doing because I'm not in the lineage of Aaron. I said, wow. Probably ought to read the Bible. And I shared all the scriptures that told them I had every reason to do what I'm doing. I said, why don't you just come to my home group and see what God does? Why don't you just show up? Why don't you be humble and show up? You knocked on my door to tell me what you, and I'm telling you, why don't you just come to my home group? They came to my home group. It was amazing. They saw words of knowledge. They watched God move. They had their hands in their head, or head in their hands the whole time, and then they finally decided they better leave. I took them out on the front porch and hugged them dearly and thanked them for the humility that brought them to my home. And I said, you can come back anytime. Now, I wish it would end ended different, but watch this. This is true. This was 20, 
23 years ago, I still live in the same house for the last 35 years. I've been in the same home. I still live there. Watch this. They have never stepped on my block since then. I talked to somebody that came out of their movement. They said, you're blackballed. You're on a map. They don't go there because... <laughs> no, it's true. Because I still live there, they won't come on my neighborhood because they don't want the young people to be confronted by me because they had no answer for me. So instead of repent and change, they just blackballed me. So I'd rather it be different. But they haven't been on my street. Before I knew Jesus, they'd knock on my door all the time and I'd just say, oh, I have my beliefs, thank you, and close the door in their face. And once I had answers, they never came. And I said one day, I was moving some, some single mama and we were helping him move. And, and I said, you know, somebody said, they just knocked on my door. I said, they've never come to my house since I've been saved and I'm finally ready to talk to them because now I, I used to just avoid and it was like two days later ding ding I looked out and there they were on my porch I'm like oh my goodness <laughs> so when Christ who is our life because we're setting our mind on things above right we died we died guys it's imperative you die if you've never been water baptism baptized please go get water baptized look at water baptism it's a death burial and resurrection you die in the likeness of his death so you live in the newness of life Water baptism is powerful. I've seen people healed, restored. We've seen girls that cut their bodies terribly go under the water baptismal waters. You bring them out, and all their scars are gone. We've seen that a lot. We've seen sickness leave. I was in Denver. Seven people wore eyeglasses. They came out of water baptism. We didn't even preach on it. I just preached old things pass away, all things become new. They came out of the water baptism, and none of them could see with their glasses on. It was amazing. It was just amazing. <laughs> There's just a lot of things. We did one guy, and he came up to me and said, man, that was amazing. He said, I don't know what you did when you put me in. It must have been the way you laid me or moved me because I go to a chiropractor every single day just to function. And you just, it's like you put me under and the way you laid me, it's like everything must have just, you gave me some kind of amazing adjustment. I just don't have nothing. <laughs> and I said, I said, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And he went, whoa. <laughs> it was so sweet. We've seen a lot of beautiful things in water baptism because we don't teach it as the next ordinance or the next step to follow. We teach it as a manifestation of grace that comes to the finished work to make all things new. You're dying to the old. You're coming out even as God raised Jesus by the glory of the Father from the dead. Even so, we'll be raised in the newness of life. Yeah? So when I teach people about getting born again, I always make sure they understand they're dying, they're giving up themselves, and they're giving up their life. I never make it about heaven, I make it about being one with him and dying to themselves so they can live unto him. That's what I do. Because nobody ever did that for me. They just told me if I don't go to church and stay in church, I better be in church when Jesus comes back because if I'm not, that's trouble. So I'm going to church, not sure why I'm there, I'm young and I'm wondering if he's coming back. And then you watch movies where people are disappearing and you're a little wigged out and you're just wondering and you're just like, whoa. And then you come home someday, hey, and nobody answers. <laughs> <laughs> therefore, therefore, put to death, put to death, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, it's all idolatry, Okay. So because we're seated with Christ, we're in him, we're going to seek the things that are above, we're going to set our mind on things above because we died and our life is hidden with Christ and when Christ appears, we're going to appear with him. Therefore, we're going to put to death life as we've known it. He didn't say find a healthy balance, find control and manage. He said kill life as you know it. First thing, I don't have a lot of time to get into this. I'm, I'm running out of time fast, but watch this. The first thing on every carnal list, every list of the flesh, the first thing on every list is sexuality. Why? Because it's driven by sensuality. What he's saying is put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion. What he's saying is, see, there's some teachers that will teach you God gave you your sex drive. God didn't give you your sex drive. Adam gave it to you. 
You were born into Adam. You got to get born again. God never made you to live at the expense of another person. No one has the identity on the earth to scratch your itch or meet your need. Oh boy, I can feel that one spinning. It's all perverted. It all has self-centeredness. Come on, I found a pornography magazine when I was 11. was 11. It was the end of me. It ruined my life. It wrecked me. It was inevitable anyway. It was going to happen because I'm in the world and I have no other answer. But I found that book when I was 11 and it ruined me. And it lied to me. And the night I got saved, I went home and I knew in the morning when I woke up, the first thing in my mind was the perversion of sexuality and what I thought manhood was. And I got confronted by the Spirit of God. And I said in tears pouring out of my eyes, you could not have made me this way because it's at the expense of another person. I said that 12 hours old in the Lord. I knew it in the Holy Ghost. And I rolled out of my bed and fell to my knees and I said, I can't change this. I don't know how to change this, but I believe you can. I don't want to be this way. And I can't tell you how he does it, but when you're sincere, he does stuff. <laughs> and it changed me. First thing on the list, put to death. He didn't say balance, control. Put to death fornication. That means your desires, your passions. For Fornication is any sexual activity outside of covenant marriage. Hello? Any sexual activity outside of covenant marriage. It's fornication. Passion, evil desire, covenant. It's all idolatry. It's all letting something matter more than what matters most. We were born into that. It's Adam. Therefore, because we're in Christ now, put it all to death because we're born again. You get it? Okay. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience. That means the ones that continue to disobey and continue to live this way. In which you yourselves, this is why we're humble and not self-righteous and holier than thou. This is why we understand and have compassion. Because we all live this way at some level. When we walk this way and live this way. But now, but now, but right now, you yourselves. It's not an order call. It's not a spirit of deliverance. It's not a spirit of anger. It's a wrong motive in your life. You yourselves are to put off anger. Watch. Wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouths. Okay. How am I going to put off fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and it's all idolatry, anger, wrath, the list is getting longer, Lord, this is really intense, how am I going to put off all these things without running the risk of getting into works and failing? Good question, preacher, I sure hope you have an answer. Good question? He's going to give us the answer. He told us to put what? Put off. Don't you lie to one another. Why? Because you've put off the old man with his deeds. Uh Uh-oh, verse 10. And So if you put something off, you have to put something what? It's what repentance is. Change the way you think. It's a turning from, turning to. So if you put off the old man, now you're going to put on the who? Okay, who's this new man? He's renewed in knowledge according to or in agreement with. The very image of the very one who created us. You see the purpose of the cross? The purpose of the cross is to restore the image that was lost. To get rid of self-centeredness and cause love to dominate our lives. The goal of our instruction is love. If he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? If any man loves his brother, there's no cause for stumbling because of him. It's 1 John 2. If any man, he says, he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. 1 John 2. This is how we know love is perfected. 1 John 4, 17. Then in the day of judgment, we have boldness. How can we have boldness on a day of darkness and gloom where people are running, screaming, and trying to hide from the presence of God? Isn't that what the Bible says? 
How can you have boldness? Because as he is, so are we right now in this world. It's called Christianity. <laughs> it's not a passport out of here. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So how do I get into this list and how do I put off and put on without getting into works and running the risk of failing? You're saved by what? Grace through. I get along with God. It's my prayer life. It's my communion life. Jesus never said eternal life was heaven. He said eternal life was relationship with the eternal one. Jesus said he gave, he's given eternal life to as many as he's given me. And he said this is eternal life that you might know him. We've turned eternal life into a prayer we repeat on the back of a track. He said eternal life is a relationship. First John 4 says, if I don't love, it's because I don't know him. That means I got to get to know him because that's how I become love. It means I can't know him without becoming more like him. Yay. <laughs> He's not talking about a theology. He's not talking about Bible memorization. Some of the people that I've met in my life that know the Bible through and through are some of the meanest dispositioned people I've ever met. They're angry, they're contentious, and they're full of debating. And they're busy trying to be right theologically. And they've allowed knowledge to puff them up. And they're letting the knowledge of the Bible take the place of knowing him. When you stand before God someday... He's not going to be impressed with how many scriptures you quoted because that's going to hold you more accountable. He's going to wonder if you clothed the naked, visited the people in prison and fed the hungry and visited the sick. He's going to wonder if you lived outside yourself because if you did, you were like him. But if you didn't do those things, you were self-centered. The only difference between the sheep and the goats, one group lived outside of their own need. The other group lived for themselves. It didn't say that one group prayed a prayer and the other failed to. You ought to read your Bible. You know them by their... So here's what you do. I got nine and a half minutes, man. I'm cruising. You get alone with God when nobody's looking. And you might even end up kneeling before him. You might want to get communion elements. But you start putting off the things that you know that you agreed with in your life. And even if you struggle with sexuality, if you struggle with loneliness, if you struggle with fantasies and visions, and, 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 and then you just have to watch something, and then you're caught up in masturbation and the whole nine yards of all this stuff, and you're living in this crazy world, or every once in a while you just get lonely, and you cross a line, and you do something with somebody else that's vulnerable. Listen, you got to get alone with God and say stuff like this. You never made me this way. You never made me to be angry, to be driven, to be under the bondage or, or control of any of these things of the flesh. Lord God, you never ever created me to submit to these things or be ruled by these things. You created me to walk in the light, for you to live in me and shine through me and to walk in love. And Lord God, I just separate myself from any of these things. I am not a man of anger, frustration, disappointment, offense. Lord, nobody owes me a thing. Holy Spirit, you're working this in my heart, and I thank you for grace that's changing me. Why? Every time I release faith in the truth, Grace comes to make that truth my reality without me biting my lip trying to accomplish it. So therefore, I'm not doing it. I'm becoming it. All of a sudden, as a man thinketh, so he is. All of a sudden, the scripture says, I'm a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. I've been alone with the righteous one believing that. Guess what I come out of the room being? A tree of righteousness without trying to be. Guess what the fruit is on my tree? The nature of God, the work of righteousness. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm not trying to do this thing. I'm becoming this thing through intimacy, communion, and prayer. And when nobody's looking, I'm seeking him in the secret. And he who's in secret will see me there and reward me in the... What am I seeking in secret? The truth of who he is in my life. What's the reward I get in the open? Him. You get it? 
This shore beach just praying a list of needs that's driven by fear and worry and concern that's almost all the time faithless. I've seen prayer chains that are worldwide that are driven by fear. And it's just the problem that's motivating the prayer with very little answer. Oh, no. Oh, my. Pray, pray. Get it around. Get word around. Get everybody praying. And there's this hysteria around the circumstance. And now we're all praying. What you're doing is you're reducing the Bible to principles you're quoting, hoping something happens. It takes one in faith to move a mountain. You kneel and you separate yourself from the flesh and the works of the flesh. And then you put on. Wow, Father, I thank you. Here's what my personal prayer life looks like. Don't try to quote it at home. Let it be your own. But I've walked countless times that you have no idea how much I've done this in my bedroom. Father, I just thank you. My life has changed. I'm I'm changed forever. You saved me and you set me free. You saved me from the wisdom of the world. You saved me from the wisdom of man, from an analytical mind and just mere intellect. God, you have put wisdom and truth in me through your scripture and Holy Spirit. You're amazing. Thanks for leading me in all truth. Never again will I succumb to just frustration and, and, and discouragement and despair, God. Nobody in this world owes me a thing. You have filled me to the full and I am a tree ripe for the picking. There is fruit hanging on my tree and men eat of me and pick of my life and eat of you. And God, there is fulfillment and there is freedom and there is liberty and there is love. God, I thank you. I am camping by these living waters. You have transformed my life. Continue to have your way. When I look through my eyes, I thank you. I see what you see and what has always been there. God, your heart is in me and I live from the place where you abide. I appreciate you and I am glad I'm one with you. My God. That's just how I talk, pray, driving. I'm talking like that. Just driving, talking like that. Thank you, Father. Nobody owes me a thing. Thank you for fathering me. Thank you, God, that when men see my life, they get a real good look at who you are. God, thank you that you could actually live in me and use my life to bring a man to truth and bring a man to freedom. Father, have your way. I don't want anything but truth in my life. I have a greater confidence in you to keep me than me to miss it, so I'm going to run hard. Kick me if you have to to keep me on track, but God, I'm here to do your will. That's how I talk to him all the time. And guess what he does? He says, oh, and grace starts coming. And grace is not God's permission slip. Grace is God's empowerment. This is how you know when somebody's preaching a perverse grace, when they're preaching grace apart from transformation. Grace is here to transform you, not empower you to stay the same. Don't get grace and mercy mixed up. Grace is God's willingness to use his power and his ability on your behalf to make you what you could never be in your own strength. As I release faith in the truth, grace comes to make truth my reality. Guess who gets all the glory? He does, because now I am what I am by the grace of God, and it's not works. It's grace. Yeah? And then I come out of the bedroom from kneeling and I'm putting off and I'm putting on and I wake up out of that or I get up out of that place and I walk into life and all of a sudden I get thrown into life circumstances like we all do and all of a sudden this different response starts coming out of me. All of a sudden I start seeing things different because I'm in that place. I'm convicted. I'm in the light. You get it? Come on, you're going to work and you're not complaining and you're not dreading and you're not just a ball of flesh. You're going to work and you've communed with God. You're in the bathroom. You're in the spirit. You're connected with God. It's not that you have to sit down and do your daily devotion book. If you have a chance, do it. But don't just do your daily. You can do your daily devotion book and never commune with the Lord. You can play Christian music all day and sermons all day and never contact God. Man, when that song's playing and it touches you, talk to him. Wow, that's amazing you did that. That's exactly how you see me. Holy Spirit, you're amazing in my life. I so appreciate the work you're doing in me and the work you want to do through me. I am yielded. I am surrendered. Have your way in me. Wow, the way you see me in righteousness, God, is amazing. And you're driving right and keep your hand on the wheel, keep your eyes open. And right now, God, I thank you that I'm clean. I thank you, God, that I'm accepted in the beloved. God, you had never lost sight of me. You had your eyes on me when I thought I was lost. You knew right where I was. You have never, ever changed your mind about me. It would do you so good to believe that. Yeah? It's called putting off, putting on. 
Okay, so we put off, we put on. We're going to do something real quick. Ah, I got two minutes. Where's Tom? I'm going to be a little bit late. <laughs> hey, it's, look, it's my last night with you guys. I'm going to be a little bit late. Are you okay if I'm a little bit late? Look, look, and if Tom fires me, he fires me. It's not going to cost him anything because it doesn't call, have to cost him anything to have me here. So. <laughs> It's not like he's going to have to give me severance pay or anything. <laughs> Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. So we just put off. We put off what? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. Man, if you're struggling with that stuff, you get alone with God. Stop asking people to pray for you, pray for you, pray for you. Get alone with him. And separate your identity from believing you have to be that way. You talk to him in prayer. You say, Father, I just thank you that I don't have to be driven anymore by this. Father, I call this unholy. It's not who I was created to be. It's who I became through Adam. But I'm born again. Christ, you live in me. And who you are is dominating my life. And I thank you. I don't ever again have to be driven. Bam, bam, bam. That's why I told you that story about the prostitute in my car. And I said, guys, remember how I got strong with the guys? I said, guys, zero temptation. That's how it's possible. Because I settled that in prayer. And I came up in the grace of God and walked out of my bedroom in the grace of God and I was changed. Why? Because I settled it in prayer. You get it? Okay, watch this. I need you to stand to your feet with me, please. I need you to receive this tonight. We're going to close with this. Because now we're going to put on. Now we're going to put on. Okay? We're going to put on. I'm going to read to you what we're going to put on. Because listen... If he just broke down with adjectives the work of the flesh and the thing we're putting off, and he said, put on the new man, don't you think he's going to break down and describe the new man? I'm going to read the new man to you, okay? Here's what I want you to do personally before the Lord. You and the Lord, just don't be distracted. Now is not the time to be distracted. I want you to believe this before the Lord and tell him you want to wear this all the days of your life. And then you start living there, praying there, communing there and watch what happens to the consistency of your days yeah fair enough okay therefore I'm talking to you all right now and I'm going to read therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved put on tender mercies kindness humility meekness long suffering Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ has forgiven you, you also must forgive. But above all these things, put on love. It is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were all called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Psalms and hymns and even spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do, people, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, I pray this revelation over us. I thank you, God, that you have jump-started us into a union and communion with you that understands how to put off and put on where there's no condemnation ruling our lives anymore, no sense of failure, no guilt, and no shame. I thank you no one has stepped into something running the risk of failing. You have too many answers for us. We are privileged to become. If anyone seems to miss the mark in this venture, thank you that they know to run to you and never run from you. Lord God, thank you that this room will not spend one minute in condemnation. They will live in true conviction, keep their conscience clear before you, and stay on your lap as a child. God, I thank you, Lord God, that you have sent Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and empower us in this race. Let no one grow weary in well-doing. Let confidence be strong, and let us see you more, love you more, and yield to you like never before. I'm asking you to take everything 
every revelation that was shared this weekend and let it be life to us. Let it bear fruit unto you and unto the world around us. Let the world pick off of this house what you're doing in us and let them be satisfied. In Jesus' name, I pray this grace. Amen? Amen. And amen. And amen. Yeah. I did it. I'm minus three. Look, I, we didn't do a lot of praying for people, a lot of ministry. Usually we pray for the sick and do a lot of things. I can't even explain to you this teaching thing that's, that's been on me. I think you can tell, Pastor. You understand. It's just this teaching thing. I feel like the Lord wants us instructed. We're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So if we can get the knowledge, we can stop destruction. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Amen? Love you guys.